Hello, dear students, welcome. It's expected while listening to this particular lecture that you already understood the principles of general pharmacology, which we did extensively. If you haven't done it, please go back and do the general pharmacology in details. And now we are going to overview, we are going to discuss various factors which modify the drug effect and we are going to listen to some interesting things about the drug development. Factors modifying drug effect, that's the first issue and we already gone through various factors which can modify drug effect. We are going to take them together now and we are also going to understand some new things. Factors modifying drug effect could be the factors which are related to the patient or could be related to the drug. First we discuss about the patient related factors. As you see on the slide, it could be age, the body size or weight, the sex, the species and the race the genetic factors, the psychological or emotional factors like placebo and the patient compliance and the presence of disease in the patient. The drug related factors as you see here could be the route of administration, the environment or time of administration, the accumulation, tolerance, tachyphylaxis, drug dependence and the various drug interactions. We start with the factors which are related to the patient. And the first factor is age. Age makes a lot of difference and you need to modify the drug dosage as far as the children are concerned. There are two formulae which are age old known. One is the young formula is the dose in the child will be equal to the age divided by age plus 12 multiplied by the adult dose. The second formula is the dueling formula which gives you the dose in a child as the age of the child divided by 20 multiplied by the adult dose. The children have got less body surface area. They also have immature liver as well as the kidney. They have prolonged half-life of various drugs. We need to keep these facts in mind while discussing the dosage in children. We already discussed an example in general pharmacology. The child has got ill-developed or less developed liver and this is why chloramphenicol may not get conjugated by gluconide conjugation, might accumulate and might produce grey baby syndrome especially in the neonates that's the defective conjugation and excretion so also it might be difficult for the children to use the tablets or aerosols which might be difficult to administer just like in the children old age is another important issue gerontology or geriatric pharmacology is going to deal with these issues at old age the patients have got less glomerular filtration rate, less blood flow. There is likely to be accumulation of various drugs and you are likely to have exaggerated effects of drugs and you might need less doses as compared to the, the patients who are of younger age. Dejoxin, beta agonist, the beta blockers, they are likely to produce less effect at old age. Whereas calcium channel blockers angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and diuretics are likely to produce a better response if the age of the patient is too old. As you know, only in males there can be prostate enlargement at old age and the elderly patients are likely to be on multiple medication due to a lot of various diseases. There can be a lot of drug interactions because the patient is receiving too many drugs and thirdly, the patient is tired of taking the drugs. It's difficult for the patient to remember taking the drugs at definite schedules. And this is why there may be non-compliance to the treatment. The next important factor which matters is the body size and weight. Clerk formula tells us how to decide the dose depending on the body weight. The dose will be equal to the weight in kilograms divided by 70 multiplied by adult dose. If we want the dose to be more perfect, this we do for some drugs which have got a narrow margin of safety. We need to go to the body surface area of the patient. The dose is equal to the body surface area of the patient in meter square divided by 1.7 as a normal body surface area expected multiplied by adult dose. And you calculate the body surface area by the various formulae which are available. Sex is another factor which can make a difference. The females have a different body size and usually they require lower dosage, the lower side of the dose range. In males, you can have gynecomastia due to various drugs 
like azoles and metoclopramide. As far as the sex is concerned, pregnancy has got a lot of physiological changes which we need to keep in mind and when the mother is lactating, she is likely to excrete the drugs through the milk to the infant and we already discussed in details at least the three A's you need to remember is am iodiron, amphetamine and androgens. It's very important issue whether I can prescribe a drug to a pregnant woman or not. Based on this, we have pregnancy risk categories and it's pregnancy risk category A, B, C, D or X. We're going to come to it later but before that just a reminder to you which we already discussed the various drugs which can produce structural defects or teratogenicity are thalidomide, anti-epileptics like phenytoin and carbamazepine, you have warfarin, an oral anticoagulant, alcohol producing very severe adverse effect in the fetus, ACE inhibitors producing hypoplasia of various organs and lithium producing various structural defects. So also you have anti-cancer drugs. Yes, I was saying about the pregnancy risk categories. You can have a look at the slide A, B, C, D and X. As you go down and down, the risk goes on increasing. So in the category X, you have estrogens, isotretinoin and ergometrine, absolutely contraindicated in pregnancy. But as you go up and up, you have got safer drugs, comparatively safer, which can be prescribed to the pregnant woman like for example, category A is magnesium sulfate injection or thyroxine and B includes very important drugs which are beta-lactam antibiotics, penicillin V, amoxicillin and the various cephalosporins. Whereas if you go to C, you have your chloramphenicol, which is going to produce gray baby syndrome, which is going to produce abnormalities in the fetus. And if you go to the category D, you have aminoglycosides, except gentamicin, and you also have tetracycline, and carbamazepine, phenytoin, valproate, all of them producing fetal hydantoin syndrome. Next we move on to species and race. The rabbits are known to be resistant to atropin and the rats and mice are known to be resistant to digitalis. This is about the animal species. But as far as the human beings are concerned, there's a better response in the blacks with diuretics and calcium channel blockers. And in whites, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors are known to produce better response. The next important factor is the genetic factor and we have a separate science called pharmacogenetics and another one called pharmacogenomics. Pharmacogenetics deals with various genetic factors present in the patient which affects the effect of the drugs. Pharmacogenomics is trying to apply the drug variation response to an individual patient to modify or to modulate the individual drug therapy which is an upcoming science. As you know, according to Gaussian distribution, some persons may be producing too less response or some other might be producing too much of response. We need to keep this in mind as also you can get unexpected adverse events in few of the patients. There are some specific genetic variations or defects concerned with the drug metabolism. We already know there's atypical pseudocholinesterase enzyme failing to metabolize the succinylcholine leading to succinylcholine apnea in few patients or hemolysis getting precipitated in glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficient patients if they get exposed to primaquine or sulfonamide group of drugs or malignant hyperthermia getting precipitated by halothen in those patients who have an abnormal rhinodyne receptor or there are people who show genetic polymorphism and this is why you have rapid and slow acetylators for drugs like isoniazid, hydrolyzine and procainamide. So also, warfarin can produce bleeding in those patients who are slow metabolizers of warfarin. The next important factor is a psychological and emotional factor which includes placebo. Few patients react to the placebos. Placebo is a medication which is pharmacologically inert but is going to give relief to the patient. Those patients who respond to this are going to be placebo reactors. Placebo is also used during the clinical trials as a control and we will refer to this when we come to the discussion of clinical trials. The next important issue is the patient compliance and patient compliance is decided 
by the kind of drug, by the kind of formulation you have prescribed, depends also on the personality of the patient and the environment of the patient and depends on the personality of the physician and his ways to express and explain the things to the patient. Presence of disease is another important factor and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and corticosteroids can precipitate peptic ulcer in the patients. If the patient already suffers from liver diseases, the drug is likely to be metabolized less, excreted less and which can lead to the toxicity of the drugs. Morphine, barbiturates, propranolol, diazepam, these are going to matter much as far as liver diseases are concerned. On the other hand, some drugs can be nephrotoxic like aminoglycosides, cephalosporins, cisplatin, amphotericin B and most importantly vancomycin. So we were dealing with the patient related factors. Now we go to the drug related factors. The first one is of course the route of administration he is going to modify the drug effect. The next one is the environment or the time of administration. As we all know a drug which is going to depress the central nervous system if it's administered during morning hours it's just going to produce a sedative effect. Whereas the same drug given at night or given in the evening is going to produce hypnotic effect. So also HMG CoA reductase inhibitors, the statins, which are very commonly used for management of hyperlipidemia and various other diseases, they are likely to produce a better action if they are given at night because the HMG CoA reductase enzyme has got its maximal activity at night. The next important drug related factor is cumulation, and we have seen at various places there are drugs like chloroquine, amiodiron, digoxin and DDS, that's Dapsone, are the drugs which are going to accumulate. Another drug related factor is tolerance, which is adaptation. When you keep on using the drug for a long period of time, the drug keeps on producing less and less response. The tolerance can be natural in few species and few races, or it could be acquired on repeated long term use of a medication which is very classically seen with nitrates, with levodopa or with alcohol. The next important issue is tissue tolerance in which few tissues become tolerant and few tissues don't become tolerant. A classical example is of morphine for which the central nervous system becomes tolerant and that's why your effects of euphoria go on decreasing when morphine is used over a long period of time whereas the gastrointestinal tract and the pupils do not become tolerant and this is why in spite of taking morphine for a long period of time morphine addicts will have a symptom of constipation and they are likely to have constricted pinpoint pupils. The next one is called cross tolerance which could be within the group or outside the group for example if you are tolerant to one substance from a particular group you might be tolerant to all the drugs from the same group. The tolerance can happen by two mechanisms. One is the pharmacokinetic tolerance, that's dispositional tolerance because the metabolism or the breakdown of the drug is affected. And the second one is of course pharmacodynamic, that's as far as the effect of the drug is concerned and this happens at cellular level because the cells get used to the effect of the drug. The drug related factors also include tachyphylaxis. Tachyphylaxis is nothing but acute tolerance. If you go on giving repeated administration of a drug at short time interval, then the response decreases. And this happens with drugs like ephedrine, amphetamine and tyramine. Next important factor which is going to modify the drug effect is the drug dependence. In drug dependence, you have a compulsive use for pleasure. You get your ADLs, that's activities of daily living affected. And when the drug is stopped, you are likely to get the withdrawal symptoms. There are various phases in the happening of drug dependence. First one is habituation, which is not too serious. The second one is abuse. The next stage is the dependence of the drug. And the last one is addiction, which has more social and occupational domain. Presence of other drugs is going to lead to a lot of drug interactions. And the drug interactions could be pharmacodynamic or could be pharmacokinetic. So these are the various effects and the various drugs which are going to affect each other. We now move on to the adverse effects of drugs. 
and the adverse effects of drugs is also called as intolerance. To have a simple definition, it's failure to tolerate or you can also call them as unwanted effects or undesired effects. The failure to tolerate could be on the basis of quality or on the basis of quantity. So intolerance could be qualitative or it could be quantitative. Qualitative is you are not tolerating a drug not because of the excessive doses of the drug but because of some inherent quality of the drug itself and something which is inside the patient. So this is a non-dose related adverse effect and it's also called type B reaction or bizarre reaction. Whereas quantitative intolerance is regarding the dose. So it's called dose related intolerance and it's also called type A or augmented type of intolerance. The qualitative intolerance as we already said can happen with a single dose and there are two types of intolerance which can happen. One is the hypersensitivity reaction or what you call allergic reaction in which you definitely have a proof of the hypersensitivity or immunological basis for the reaction. The second one is called idiosyncrasy in which you cannot demonstrate any immunological basis for this particular intolerance. It could be idiopathic that you don't know the exact cause of this or there could be a genetic factor implemented and the patient is genetically predisposed to get this particular intolerance. Hypersensitivity reactions can be classified into type 1, 2, 3 and type 4. Hypersensitivity could be immediate, for example, the anaphylactic reaction to penicillins. Steven Johnson syndrome, which could be to sulfa and sulfonamide group of drugs. Then you have delayed hypersensitivity reaction, for example, the maculopapular skin eruption with ampicillin and fixed drug eruption. Regarding the qualitative intolerance, we have idiosyncrasy and we have example of bone marrow separation and a granulocytosis produced by chloramphenicol or hemolysis produced in G6PD deficient patients by a number of drugs like primaquine, sulfur drugs, phenolones, so on and so forth. Now we move to what is quantitative intolerance. And you are likely to come across three different terms. The first one is called side effect. The second one is called untoward effect. And the last one is called toxic effect. Side effect is the one which is mild and which is produced when the drug is given in therapeutic doses. The untoward effect also happens when the drug is given in therapeutic doses but the untoward effect is quite severe and the patient feels like stopping the drug. Whereas toxic effects are those effects which can happen due to acute overdose of a drug or which can happen on chronic administration of a drug and the toxic effects are quite severe. Depending on if the drug is safe or no, to decide the margin of safety of the drug, we have an index called therapeutic index and its typical formula is the median lethal dose divided by the median effective dose. Sometimes you can also calculate it by a formula median toxic dose divided by the median effective dose. The drugs which have got very high therapeutic index are supposed to be comparatively safer drugs and they include the penicillins and cephalosporins which are beta-lactam antibiotics, macrolid antibiotics, aspirin, ibuprofen, paracetamol. They are the few examples. The drugs with low therapeutic index include morphine, barbiturates, digoxin and digitoxin, phenytoin, antiarrhythmic agents, tetracyclines and chloramphenicol amongst the broad spectrum antibiotics as well as aminoglycosides and lithium. Now what's iatrogenic disease? Iatrogenic disease is something which is happening inside the patient, some abnormality happening inside the patient due to the drug administration. So the disease produced due to administration of drug treatment. This often could happen when corticosteroids are given for a long time, the patient starts showing the manifestations of Cushing's. Or NSAIDs or steroids can produce peptic ulcer. Antipsychotic drugs can produce various involuntary movements including Parkinson-like movement and isoniazid can precipitate hepatitis. So these are all the examples of iatrogenic disease. Now we are going to discuss how a new drug is brought to the market which is called evaluation of a new drug or a very interesting term for this is journey of a drug from laboratory to the world. 
Of course, a new drug is first tried and tested in animals. And this is called animal testing, which is required in at least two species. The first one is acute toxicity testing to observe the effects, including the calculation of lethal doses. Then you go for subacute testing, which may last for two to four weeks. And the next one is the chronic toxicity testing, which may last from six months to two years. The purpose of animal testing is to know the pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic profile of the new substance, to know about the reproductive toxicity, including teratogenicity and mutagenicity, a means test decides the mutagenicity, and testing for the carcinogenicity. At the end of the animal trials, now we come to know that yes, this drug is ready to use for human experiments and then we start using it in human beings for experimentation and it's called clinical trials, it's testing of the drug in human beings. Clinical trial phase 1 is conducted in small number of human volunteers which are normal and which don't suffer from any illness. And this is for the assessment of the pharmacokinetic characteristics and the safety of the drug. Then the drug passes on to phase 2 and in this we have a moderate number of patients with target diseases and there could be 100 to 300 patients included in this trial. A placebo or a positive control is used during these trials and the design may be single blind or double blind. The purpose of phase 2 is to know if the agent has desired therapeutic effects at doses that are tolerated by the patients. I used the words positive control. What's positive control? Is the known standard drug for this particular disease. And what we need to do is to evaluate the effects of the new drug under evaluation and to compare the effects with an existing known standard drug. What is single blind and double blind? Now the patients are going to receive either a new drug or they are going to receive a placebo or they might receive a positive control that's a known standard drug. If the patient doesn't know what he is going to receive, then it's called a single blind trial. Crossover means changing the sequence of giving the placebo or the new drug under evaluation on a different occasion. Double blind means with the patient, also the investigator or the doctor or the physician who is conducting this experiment does not know if the patient is going to receive a placebo or if the patient is going to receive the new drug. So that's called double blind when the patient as well as the investigator doesn't know. There is also something called triple blind. In this triple blind, the statistician or the data analyst also does not know what data he is receiving. This particular data is about the new drug or is about the placebo is unknown to the data analyst or statistician. Then we call it triple blind. So that's regarding the phase 2 and now we move on to phase 3 of clinical trials which is a large multicentric design. Whatever you have been proving at your own center has to be proven at multiple centers. So obviously there are a large number of patients included about 1000 to 5000 patients and all these trials will be double blind trials with the use of placebo or the positive control. This is going to determine further the spectrum of beneficial actions of this new substance is going to compare it with the older therapies and is going to discover any undetected toxicities which we could not re reveal during the phase 2 clinical trials. After this, that's the phase 3, the drug is brought to the market after the marketing permission from the Food and Drug Administration. And when the drug is in the market, we also conduct the last phase of clinical trials that's called phase 4 and it's after marketing so it's called post marketing surveillance when you start using a drug in patients over a long period of time you might notice some new toxic effects which you never discovered before or you might also discover new beneficial effects of a drug so you need to keep a watch on the further status status of this drug to report the undiscovered effects over a long period of time, that's called the post-marketing surveillance. Now a newly introduced phase is called phase zero and this is microdosing. Here you give a single sub-therapeutic dose in a patient with non-target disease and the number of patients to be used 
are just 10 to 15 small number of patients. So this is called phase zero. You can have a look at this slide of drug development which is going to tell you approximately how much time is consumed during whole of the process. The in vitro studies are carried out for zero to two years. Then the drug goes for animal studies, in vivo studies to know the effects and the kinetics and the toxicity. This might last for another two years. So that's from two to four years. Next, the clinical testing, which requires ethical clearance, could be phase one, phase two and phase three. And this is carried out from the year four to year eight to nine. So that's issue of another four to five years. And after the marketing, that's the post-marketing surveillance, the phase four may last for another 10 years. So overall, to know everything about a drug, possibly to know everything about a drug, it could take 20 years or so. What is an orphan drug? An orphan drug. Orphan drug is a drug which is not very commonly used. It may be a drug used for a rare disease that's affecting fewer than 200,000 people. Or the drug may be for common diseases, but it's not cost effective to manufacture this drug because this drug is used for an endemic disease which is present only in the resource poor countries. And when you want to manufacture this kind of a drug, it becomes very difficult for the pharmaceutical to manufacture and to bear the expenses. The sale might not pay the cost of the drug development, hence study of such drugs might get neglected. The tax relief and other incentives are arranged and encouraged to develop the orphan drugs. The next important concept is essential drugs. And according to the World Health Organization, essential drugs are the drugs which satisfy the priority healthcare needs of the population. Only those drugs will be called essential drugs. The use of these drugs should have public health relevance. There should be definite evidence of safety and effectivity and the use of the drug should be cost effective in the sense that it should be made adequately available, it should be available in appropriate dosage forms in which it could be used and we should have an assured quality and adequate information about the drug. So that's regarding the drug development, the orphan drug and essential drugs. Now we are going to discuss pharmacology of enzyme inhibition. It's an altogether different chapter, altogether novel chapter and I'm sure studying this chapter properly is going to help you a lot to solve your multiple choice questions in various kinds of examinations. If you look to the pharmacology with a bird's view, we are going to understand that there are various number of drugs which act by inhibiting a particular enzyme. It may be in the human being or it may be in the microorganisms. But inhibiting an enzyme itself is a very important mechanism of action of these drugs. So we have a table here, a long table, which is going to tell you about a drug and which enzyme is inhibited. This could be a very relevant and valuable information for you. Enzyme dopa decarboxylase is inhibited by carbidopa and benzerazid. So these drugs are combined with levodopa for Parkinson. The enzyme acetaldehyde dehydrogenase is inhibited by disulfiram and various other drugs which produce disulfiram like effect. So you need to keep in your mind that these drugs should not be prescribed if the patient is consuming alcohol or rather when these drugs are prescribed the patient should not consume alcohol otherwise it's going to get the symptoms of alcohol intolerance. The enzyme alcohol dehydrogenase is inhibited by fomipizole which is useful in methanol poisoning. The enzyme GABA transaminase is inhibited by valproic acid, a broad spectrum anti-epileptic agent and non-selective inhibition of monoamine oxidase is done by phenelzine, isocarboxazid and tranylcypromine. Whereas reversible inhibitors, reversible selective inhibitors of MAO-A are moclobomide and chlorgelin. The enzyme COMT, catcol o transferase, is inhibited by the anti-Parkinson drugs called tolcapone and entacapone. Statins inhibit the HMG-CoA reductase enzyme. 
L-aromatase is inhibited by anastrozole, 5-alpha reductase is inhibited by finasteride and acarbose and megalitol inhibit alpha glucosidase. Coming to some bacterial enzymes, quinolones inhibit topoisomerase 2 or DNA gyrase, rifampin inhibits DNA dependent RNA polymerase and ethambutol inhibits arabinosyl transferase. As far as the adrenergic transmission is concerned, the tyrosine hydroxylase enzyme is inhibited by metyrosine. Beta-lactamase enzyme in the bacteria is inhibited by clavulanic acid, sulbactam and tazobactam. Phosphofructokinase is inhibited by sodium steboglucanate. Choline esterase enzyme is inhibited by anticholinesterase agent that's physostigmine, neostigmine and organophosphorus compounds. Cyclooxygenase is inhibited by NSAIDs and glucocorticoids. Selective COX-2 inhibitors are various COXIPs as well as lamisulide and meloxicam. Xyluton, a drug used in bronchial asthma, inhibits the enzyme 5-lipoxygenase that decreases the leukotriene synthesis. Captopril, enalapril, lisinopril are angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors which is the same enzyme as kininase 2. Acetazolamide, a diuretic, inhibits carbonic anhydrase and allopurinol, useful in gout, inhibits the uric acid synthesis by inhibiting the enzyme xanthine oxidase. An antifungal agent terbinafine inhibits squalene epoxidase in the fungus. The azole antifungals inhibit the conversion of lanosterol into ergosterol by inhibiting the enzyme 17-alpha demethylase. PABA reductase in the bacteria is inhibited by dapsone and sulfur drugs and the folate reductase enzyme is inhibited by trimethoprene, methotrexate, pyrimethamine, proguanil as well as phenytoin. Glycerol phosphate dehydrogenase is an enzyme inhibited by a drug called suramine. So this was the list of the enzymes and inhibitors. And when we are reaching the end of general pharmacologic discussion, I am going to give you some very useful tips which will be useful to you to solve your questions as far as overdose and poisoning is concerned. So we have a table in which there is a poison or there is a drug which if is given in overdose, what is going to be the antidote or what is going to be the antagonist. Very important poisoning in children is acute acetaminophen overdose, that's paracetamol. And the drug of choice for this is N-acetylcysteine. Organophosphorus compounds and insecticides, they need treatment with atropine, which is a muscarinic blocker, and oxymes, which are going to be choline esterase reactivators. Anti-muscarinic drugs like atropine, antihistamines, and anti-Parkinsonian agents all of them could have atropine like effects and this is why you, we use an anticholinesterase agent in the form of physostigmine. Tricyclic antidepressant overdose is mostly combated with the use of sodium bicarbonate by intravenous route and you could also try physostigmine to block the muscarinic, anti-muscarinic effects. Benzodiazepines and non-benzodiazepines that Zolpidem and Zalaplon are inhibited by a competitive antagonist called flumazenil. So flumazenil becomes the most important drug of choice for benzodiazepine overdose. By chance, if there is an overdose of beta blockers, you need to give a beta stimulant in the form of isoprenaline and you also need to give glucagon. Carbon monoxide poisoning is treated with oxygen. The poisoning with caffeine, theophyrin and beta agonist, the overdose, is treated with asmolol, Dejoxin toxicity, we have a specific treatment for dejoxin toxicity and that's dejoxin specific FAB antibodies. Opioid overdose with morphine and heroin is dealt with by naloxone. Another choice is nilorphine, but naloxone is a pure antagonist and this is going to be a better choice. The poisoning by heavy metals like arsenic, gold, mercury and lead is sometimes encountered and the drug of choice for all this could be BAL, that's British anti-levicide or dimercaprol. 
In place of this, you could also use oral succimer for mild lead and mercury toxicity. Lead poisoning is mostly treated with PAL or EDTA. EDTA is also useful against a number of other heavy metals and you could also use succimer for lead poisoning. Copper, iron, lead and mercury you can also treat with penicillamine. Warfarin and cumarins are dealt with by the use of vitamin K and heparins are treated, heparin overdose is treated with protamine sulfate. Now we come to some important poisoning like acute salicylate poisoning that's aspirin and we know we don't have a specific antidote. We need to do alkalinization and for which sodium bicarbonate will be useful. So also for acute barbiturate poisoning there will be sodium bicarbonate useful. Methanol and ethylene glycol overdose is treated with ethanol and formipazole. Iron and iron salt overdose toxicity is treated with desferioxamine. Most of the alkaloidal poisonings and the oral poisonings except iron, cyanide poisoning and lithium poisoning or poisoning with solvents, mineral acids and corrosives are dealt with by the use of activated charcoal. Cyanide poisoning is treated with the help of sodium nitrite and sodium thiosulfate. So this was a very important and very useful tip to solve your questions on poisoning, overdose as well as the enzyme inhibition. Thank you very much. I am sure you will do well with this general pharmacology module. Best of luck.